me, history doesn't so much as repeat as it's an echo of itself. And the best stories are also the oldest stories, ancient stories. And in every one of the readings of my favorite writers, I've always felt this strangely familiar feeling creep in, a feeling that I've read this story before. And that is exactly how I feel about each of these writers. They write ancient stories about war and conflict and chaos, stories about the innumerable ways that those forces change us, shape us, and ultimately transform us. And yet how, despite all the unstoppable change, we should hope and work towards something more. What that is, though, of course, is entirely up to us. And perhaps tonight these writers will give us a glimpse into what they think comes after war. Uh, there was this beautiful quotation that comes in Sarah's book um, in a moment where the protagonist, she, as a young girl, her father is, is telling her a story and it ends with just very simple. It says, sometimes hard things are worth the trouble. I'll introduce them uh, just kind of going down the table. Phil Cly is the author and short story collection Redeployment, while earned the national, which earned the National Book Award for Fiction in 2014. Cly is a graduate of Dartmouth College and a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. He served in Iraq's Anbar province from January 2007 to February 2008 as a public affairs officer. After being discharged, he earned his MFA from Hunter College. Cly's work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, Granta, Tin House, and elsewhere. Matt Gallagher is the author of the Iraq memoir, Kaboom, and co-editor and contributed to the short fiction collection, Fire and Forget, which many other authors are also in the audience of, of that collection. Uh, the full title is Fire and Forget Short Stories from the Long War. He holds an MFA in fiction from Columbia University and lives in Brooklyn. His novel, Young Blood, is forthcoming for Atria and Simon and & Schuster. Um, I've had the privilege of, of reading reading it in various iterations, and it's, it's excellent. It really is. Uh, Maurice Emerson DeCall, a former Marine, is a poet and essayist and playwright whose writing has been featured in the New York Times, the Daily Beast, Sierra Magazine, Narrative, and others. His theatrical works, Holding It Down and Sleep Song, have been produced and performed in New York City's Harlem Stage, Washington, D.C.'s Atlas Intersections Festival, in Paris and in Antwerp. His play, Dialogue Wall Ferrat, Between the Tigris and the Euphrates, was produced in New York City by Poetic Theater Productions in the winter of 2015. Maurice is a graduate of Columbia University, NYU, and will begin working towards his MFA in playwriting at Brown University in the fall of 2015. And Sarah Novik was born in 1987 in the United States and has lived in the U.S. and Croatia. She is a graduate of the MFA program at Columbia University, where she studied fiction and translation. She is the fiction editor at Blunderbuss Magazine and teaches writing at Columbia and the Fashion Institute of Technology. She lives in Queens, New York. So if you can give me a nice round of applause to all our panelists and stuff, thank you. So the first question I have is, is really about, one of the things that as veterans we often talk about is that you know, we are a, Words After War is a literary organization that just happens to focus on war and conflict. And oftentimes we find ourselves being asked questions about national security or policy in these forums. Um, I think for a long time maybe we rejected that, but you know, the, these questions sort of come up. So for me the first question I really wanted to ask all of the panelists was what role, if any, do you believe art should play in issues of policy and national security? And do writers in particular have a responsibility to write in favor or against a policy? Or do they have a responsibility to write towards truth, that capital T truth, even if it's unfashionable or runs counter to the national narrative? Well, I th certainly think you should be writing counter to the <laughs> national narrative, since the national narrative is likely to be too simplistic. But, um, I mean, look, I, I, I don't just want to, I don't know, Open a window, in, open a window into into a particular area of experience, right? Um, I want to I want to challenge, ideally, the things that 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 we believe about war, the things that we believe about American policy, the things that we believe about, you know, contemporary American society, because I think it's very important that, that we critically examine these things. I think that, I mean that is the role of the artist. Now, the role of the artist, is, I don't think, is to write polemics, 
right? Um, I mean, in, you know, when I was in Iraq, we used to joke uh, when we'd watch the news or, or, or anything that the way that you could tell someone who knew nothing about Iraq was how sure they were of their opinion, right? Um, and the greater certainty, the more of an ass that person was. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, literature is all about dwelling in those complexities, and that, that's part of its value. Um, but it's, it, its value is not just to have a kind of, you know, weak empathy towards the experience of somebody who's been through something hard, but, but to force the reader, or to hope, hopefully to try and get the reader to confront what that experience of another person, you know, what the experience of, of imagining yourself in the skull of another human being who's in this, you know, who's at the end of an aspect of policy that originates here with all of us. You know, what does that experience demand of us now, right? If we think very seriously about what happened in Iraq, if we think very seriously about what's happening now, it's easy to feel sympathetic towards somebody who's gone through a hard time. But the real question is, is okay, what, what obligations do I have? What responsibility do I have? Do I feel implicated in this or not? Matt, what do you have to say? I mean, I think should it, should it influence foreign policy and can it influence foreign, foreign policy are, are two different questions. I mean, should it? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I never want to generalize, but most of the f people involved in foreign policy I've met uh, have read way too much uh, Clausewitz and Machiavelli and not enough actual literature, you know, to like learn how human beings interact. Uh, so yeah, they'd be better off reading Maurice, Sarah, and, and, and Phil. Uh, uh, should it? Um, you know, I, I don't think that can influence the creative creative process. That's that's a big that's a big responsibility. I mean, writing writing a book is hard enough, let alone with the weight of of well, if if you do this right, you know, you could change the trajectory of the future of the world. Like that's that's a little heavy. Uh, on the on the other hand, it, can, it sometimes can happen. I mean, uh, uh, President Obama uh, uh, went on CNN and, and said he was reading Phil's book and. Um, uh, and uh, uh, talked about how that was kind of influencing his perception of uh, possible intervention in Syria. So yeah, it can occur, especially when you're writing about things as, as, as heavy and, and messy as, as contemporary war. But um, you know, I, I, I think whatever the topic is, a, a writer has enough of uh, a challenge ahead of them that, that these kind of questions are are fun afterwards, but um, maybe in the moments should be uh, should be set aside. Just just one man's take. All right, this is uh, kind of a difficult question. So I don't know if the idea when one is writing a piece, uh, if the idea is that you're trying to influence you know, foreign policy. Could it happen? Sure. What I've seen happen in my not my specific work, but you know, in in theater and people I know who do theater is oftentimes they are invited to go to DC, they go to the Capitol, they go to the White House, and they have an opportunity to perform in front of um, the people who make the decisions. What comes out of that, you know, I'm not sure. But the opportunity sometimes presents itself, and if it does, then yes, you, 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 you'll present work that could potentially be um, uh, instructive. Now, should you, Right to to national narrative, I would agree with Phil. You know, I, I don't think so. I, I'm not interested in writing propaganda. I'm going to write the war. I'm going to write the, the 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 play or 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 whatever it is I choose to write that I think is necessary to be written now. And if it, it's if it's uh, counter to the narrative, fine. So I don't I don't believe that we have an op a obligation to write. To the um, to the narrative because the narrative, you know, over the last what year was this? 15, uh, 14 is is problematic at the very least. So we don't necessarily have an ob we don't have an obligation to uh, write to it. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think it's kind of a funny assumption that people often make that, that writers, particularly fiction writers, uh, have like not knowledge about politics at all. Um, we, I, I was at an event uh, on the Upper East Side at Barnes & Noble with three writers and we were talking about immigration and diaspora and this woman got up and asked a question and said, well, what do you, <laughs> like, how, how do you guys think we should fix the immigrant problem? And we were all like, <laughs> uh, and, the, and the woman who was the director of Barnes & Noble like, came running across the store. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think, um, I think probably we don't maybe know much more than anyone else in, in certain ways, but the one function that I think uh, fiction can serve is to be kind of like a, an opening door and to give people the capacity for empathy for, for people that they wouldn't otherwise come across in real life um, because you hang out with those characters longer when you're reading a novel um, even you know more than journalism can and to hear from people readers who say like oh this made me think about this and want to read other stuff about it um, I think that's great that's maybe the best we can do I think just to follow on that Sarah you know we were talking backstage and we, I just had just finished your book, and I mean, absolutely blew me away. Like Sarah's book is is one of the best pieces of fiction I've read in a very, very long time, and the way that she plays with memory and and past is is just absolutely uh, remarkable. But there was something in it that struck me as a book about war and conflict in particular that felt different than when veterans write about war and conflict, and. There's been some recent criticism of post-9-11 veterans um, in Harper's Magazine and, and among other publications. Uh, for the six of you who've, who've maybe read that uh, <laughs> and care about it, um, I think Matt had the best, uh, best response. Like, you can only hope that people start to criticize your work, right? That means you've actually had That's my sanit sanitized take, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there is, there is something to be said, right? It is good to, for people to look at, at this um, from a different perspective. And I think one that I'm looking at it is that often in veterans writing, at least in my reading of it, right, and I could be wrong, is, is that we, we tend to write around violence um, in a way that when I read books about war and conflict from, from the civilians who are impacted by it, they write directly towards it in a way that doesn't feel controlled and what I mean by that, there's a scene, and actually I'm not even, I'm not even gonna give it away, because there's a scene in Sarah's book that actually brought me to tears. And that is very, very hard for, it, for, for, for me to, for, to happen to me. And so I, I just wanted to know, just for, the, for Sarah to, to talk about that, um, but also for, the, for any, of, any of you who, who maybe were, had a different take on it as well. <laughs> well, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, it's kind of what, what you were saying. It's, it's like a, a question of control, and civilians don't have control in, in war um, about any, anything, <laughs> uh, or if, if violence happens to them, if it doesn't happen to them. So the fact that that's like the focus um, for characters and for actual people when they're, when they're writing and, and thinking about that thing, I think makes sense um, because you know, we don't learn to um, to con control it in any way, and it just kind of comes to your house, to your like private space. So that's probably, I think, why that happens. And for veterans, I mean, you if you you know if you're in combat arms, uh, I wasn't, but you're you're training how to do violence. Continually, right? And then you're placed in the situation where you're in war. And I mean, I remember talking about people in the siege of Fallujah hoping that they'd get a chance to kill an insurgent because they'd been intact, you know. Um, uh, where, whereas, meanwhile, I think it was General Mattis was meeting with um, tribal elders complaining that the imams were riling people up against the Americans and then, you know, young Iraqi kids were coming out and attacking um, 
Marine positions where they had no hope of doing anything, right? They were just, just getting mowed down. Um, and he was furious because he was saying, like, stop this because they're just going to die. Um, and the, <laughs> the relationship to violence is going to be very, very different from somebody who joined the military with the expectation of being involved in it and, and dealing it out and maybe even being exci very excited about the possibility of dealing it out. And then, of course, you know, when you talk to Marines, when they come out of boot camp about the act of killing or being involved in violence versus when you talk to Marines who have actually had the experience of killing people, you get a very, very different response. And a response that, um, well, you know, and, and, and also, actually, I should say, when you talk to civilians about it, because probably the most common question that a veteran gets is, did you kill anybody, right? And I talked to one, I remember talking to one veteran who had, who'd been in a lot of combat, and he said, the thing that frustrates me about the question is not the question itself, but the fact that nobody is asking, it seems to recognize the moral seriousness behind the question, right? And so, yeah, that, that relationship between, well, between a civilian who's been in a war zone, um, a soldier who's been in a war zone, and then a civilian who has no experience of war. And, and as Americans, our, our relationship to war is totally defined by our radical distance from it. Um, if you, you know, setting aside Pearl Harbor and 9-11, the Civil War is the last time we actually had um, war here. It's, it's not something we have experience with, and that just that changes the nature of the, the way that we approach it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, th I think it's vital that um, civilians, and we really need to come up with a better term than that, because that, that it instantly is so um, uh, polarizing, right? You're, you're either civilian or you're veteran, like, I mean, I'm a civilian. I've been out five years. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not, I'm a civilian. I put on normal clothes. I can't grow a beard, you know, uh, <laughs> although I'm trying. Um, but, I, you know, I, and I think it's vital that, that uh, 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 you know, focusing on literature, that, that civilians stay engaged that way because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, 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 civilians, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, write uh, just as good of literature as veterans do about war and conflict and, and uh, armed violence, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Stephen Crane, you know, uh, uh, Red Badge of Courage, he wrote that book 30 years after the end of the Civil War as a journalist because he, that generation was dying off and he wanted to, like, it started because he wanted to, like, transcribe their stories. Ben Fountain, Lee Carpenter. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, ben Fountain, Lee Carpenter, uh, The Contemporary Wars. Uh, for my money, the best story about World War I didn't happen uh, in the trenches, it happened in Denver, uh, a story nominally about influenza that uh, called Pale, Pale Horse, Pale Rider by Catherine Ann Porter, right? Um, so it, it's vital uh, uh, that, that civili civilians write about, the, write about these topics, uh, uh, whether in a highfalutin literary kind of way or, or, or otherwise. And, and there's this weird disconnect post-Vietnam, right? Like, um, not to suggest that like veterans don't possess a certain knowledge of the subject, of course, but, but first-hand knowledge is, is only one part, right? You can get authority on a subject a multitude of ways, um, and I think it's vital in, in some small way that, that uh, bookish people push back against that, right? Because, like, you really want to get conspiracy theory, like, read the, pa read the, uh, the papers. I'm going deep down a rabbit hole now, but I'm going to finish. <laughs> uh, uh, Martin Anderson was a professor at Columbia who kind of drafted the, all volunteer, the papers for the all-volunteer force that Nixon ended up employing. The entire point of it was to, to completely separate uh, uh, the American middle class, uh, which is the, mo the majority of us, uh, from, from our foreign wars because, oh God, they're, they're troublesome. They cause problems. Like, how can we get them uh, 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 not involved in all this, right? And, and we're living that now. And, and, and um, you know, kind of get back, kind of gets back to Brandon's first question. Yeah, you know, books can can change things. I, foreign policy is a tough thing, but you know, books certainly can change one mind at a time, one reader at a time. So, so push the fuck back. Whether you're a veteran, civilian, I don't care. Um, care uh, and and, uh, and and write about it because because that matters. 
All right, I'm done. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, in terms of writing about violence, that can be extremely difficult to do. Uh, because, you know, depending on your writing, you might be writing from your own experience. So if, you're, if one is trying to write that, you might be, uh, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? It might be extremely challenging because you might be reliving those stories yourself. So it can be very hard to write those stories. Not that you shouldn't, it's just, it, it's, it's difficult and you have to learn how how to separate the self from the story and just tell the story, uh, you know, if that makes sense. So just following on that, it, does that come out of the editing process, the revision process? Is that, I mean, we're getting more into the sort of the craft, right? You have this idea, this experience you have, it's a, it's a personal history, it's a family history, it's a history of your people, and then you build a world around it. Like, you know, what does that look like? You know, it, at least for you, and, and just talking about theater. Well, I think, <laughs> Time and, and distance, right, is really important to that process. Uh, there is, I'm also a poet. There are poems that I've been trying to, that I've been trying to write for years that I just could not write. And it took me literally years to write some of the poems. And I would rewrite them and rewrite them, look at them from uh, different angles until I got to something that was okay. But it's just because the subject matter was really hard. And every time, you know, you go back into it, you're there, you know, you're reliving it. So it's really difficult sometimes to write these stories. So time, time, and also craft, yes. Craft, of course, but time is really important. Sort of talking about craft, it, it, it's sort of interesting about this generation too is that we've, we're, such, we're so few, um, and, and yet we have such opportunity for education now with the post 9 11 GI Bill and the Yellow Ribbon Program to go to liberal arts colleges, Ivy League schools. Um, you know, it's sort of similar to World War II and, and, and other generations that really were able to take advantage of the, of the GI Bill is that they're able to go back and get, go to graduate school. And so something that runs through all of you is you've been to MFA programs. But now that you've been out of it, you know, for those, of, for those veterans who, who might not be able to go to an MFA program, what, what does your community look like? Other than words after war, like what does your community look like? Like what is your network? Like who are the, who are the folks that you reach out to to give you those edit and revisions in the same way you found in your MFA programs? Well, so I, I went to Hunter College, which is amazing. Um, and I also, also, there's a veteran writing group run through NYU, which is how I met uh, Matt and Maurice. And I mean, it was a process of finding readers that I trusted. So I found readers that I trusted who are civilians at Hunter, which was very, very valuable. And um, also veteran readers that I trusted, um, which was very valuable. You know, there's, there's um, it's kind of funny when you, when you ask for feedback on a story and you're a vet and you're writing about war, um, and, and people don't know you that well, they'll sort of cede a certain degree of authority to you, because like, well, you're a vet, you know what you're talking about. And then kind of, first off, these guys will call me on bullshit straight out, which is great. Um, it's also, it's kind of a, an amazing moment when a civilian who knows nothing about Iraq um, is like, I don't know anything about Iraq, but this is total BS. Like, I know this is nonsense. I don't know what the real thing is, but this is not how humans behave, <laughs> right? Um, and you kind of get your you know, hackles up and you're like, who are you to tell me about Iraq and be right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I had an amazing experience with the MFA program. I had an amazing experience connecting with other veteran writers and both of those were important, you know, for, for understanding what I was writing about, right? Because I think when you first start writing about a, cult, a, a subject, you think that you're writing about something really unique and interesting, but you're just kind of regurgitating what's out in the culture. And you need people who are thoughtful to read what you're working on and kind of tell you that you're an asshole. And, um, and then you go back and you rewrite it a lot of times. Matt, what do you think? You teach writing, so. Uh, I do, uh, which is great at posing rhetorical questions, and uh, which is what you're doing right now. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, I, I think whether it's an MFA, whether it's uh, you know that official, or whether it's a very unofficial group, I, I think just having a writing community is just vital to, to any creative process um, because it's a, it's a lonely gig. You know, you um, I talk to my dog way too much during the day. Uh, he's he's a nice dog, but he's he's a dog. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, you know, it, it's good to get out there and get pushback, like Phil was saying, or, or, or even just get a, a, a pat on the back occasionally, right? Um, that, 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 that means a lot, too, like, to, uh, to keep doing it. I mean, uh, I, I met Sarah initially in a, uh, in a great uh, uh, war, literature, war literature class taught by Peter Moss at Columbia. Um, uh, he, he, he'd been a war correspondent in the Balkans uh, for the Washington Post and, and other places. And it was the first place where I'd, I discussed war literature amongst other veterans, but it was the first time where I was, um, I was the only vet in the classroom, and it was, I was engaging these new works that I had not read about different conflicts, because uh, you know, I, I was well read on Iraq and Afghanistan, but it turns out there's a whole other, uh, there's, there's all these other things that have occurred in the history of humanity too. Uh, and um, it, was, it was a very humbling experience, and it was, it, it was a very important experience, because it, it uh, it, the work is preeminent. I mean, always, for whatever, whatever the subject, who, whatever the background of the writer, the work has to be good. You have to, you have to make it as good as it can be, and, and that's all that matters. And, and that's such a nasal-gazing bullshit writer thing to say, I know, but it's so damn true. Like, like you can, there are no shortcuts if you, want, if, if, you, if you want to write the best damn thing you can. Um, and and uh, uh, discussing... Uh, these these top these heavy serious subjects in a classroom of people with completely different worldviews than me, completely different backgrounds than me, um, was was fascinating, mystifying, um, uh, uh, transcendental. You know, in, insert adjective here. It, it it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, uh, and did that have to happen? Have have to happen in the official MFA world? No, it did. It happened too, but. But uh, especially in New York City, like you can you can go out there and get get that. Um, so uh, anytime you you know anytime whether you're, it's about writing or politics or whatever, if you're you're surrounded by people that agree with you too much, it's probably time to branch out. Yeah. Oh, I should also mention, in addition, MFA, veteran writers, um, marrying somebody brilliant who reads your work and tells you how to make how to fix it is very important. <laughs> And I'm not just. Spouse a, shout out, yeah. yeah. Phil's, Phil's wife is in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been I've been lucky to have good readers in and out of the MFA. So, at NYU, I, I did have the experience where people, <laughs> I wrote this poem. Um, I had seen a, a, a photo online about a, a suicide bomb in Karbala. I wrote a poem about it, and you know the class what the class does, but there was one person who said. The, the perspective just feels off. <laughs> and I you know, asked, asked her for some uh, you know, clarification on what she meant by that. She's like, it doesn't, and I hadn't prefaced by saying this is an image that I saw that I'm writing from, right? She's like, it just feels off. It looks like you're looking at it through a lens. And I've also been in a room where uh, one of my poetry professors, who was a Marine, you know, done his time in the Marine Corps, but had been out for a very long time. He's one of these guys who never talks about the Marine Corps. And he, the first poem I brought in, he looked at it and said, it's terrible. And I said, well, why is it terrible? And he said, because you're writing 10 years worth of distance into that poem. You're writing 10 years. What is it, that you, what is it about the poem that you don't want to talk about? And we had a very long conversation about that. And it took another year before I could actually rewrite the poem. And I sent it to him. So, you know, it is important to have really good readers, people who will call you uh, when things are you know, not as good as it can be. In my other world, I've been lucky to have, again, several good readers that I can send work to who can give very honest feedback. And, you know, even this weekend, I was, I was away, and I wasn't intending to do a reading of the work, but people asked that we did to read the, the play. And some of the concerns that I had about that, that play, about one of the characters in particular, the audience also had. And it was good, it was good, you know, it was a good reflection of, of the writing, because I knew that was weak, and they also knew it. And now, you know, when I do the revisions, uh, I'll fix it. So it's good to have, you know, other errors. The MFA program, you know, it was fine. It was, it was, great. It was a great experience, but it's good to have just readers in general who you trust. I have people that I, 
one good friend, Mike. I send Mike everything he reads, he's, he, and he sends me feedback, and I adjust from there. So yeah, it's part of the process. What about you, you Sarah? Yeah, um, I think it's really important to have kind of unfamiliar reader, readers, people who are unfamiliar with your subject matter, and, and people who are not writers. Like one of my first readers is always my little sister, and she's like a very smart person, but not a writer at all, and will be like, boring, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, shit. Uh, <laughs> Um, so that I think that's really valuable feedback as as a writer, and also also you know people who aren't familiar with the subject that you're writing about, which you know for the war in Yugoslavia was pretty pretty easy to find. Um, but uh, the other thing that I got out of the MFA that's really valuable was uh, just like writing but buddies, a writing person who will like sit across, not even necessarily read your stuff. Like here's one now. <laughs> um, just like sit across from you and you keep your butt in the chair and I'll keep my butt in the chair and we may not talk to each other and kind of like just grimace <laughs> for a couple hours uh, and that's, that's an invaluable thing to have I think and I've actually been rethinking the MFA I, I look at it differently than when I first Maurice is starting his second MFA in the fall <laughs> it, should, it should be noted thank you yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> and it has to do with that, because I have one, so I don't need another one. So it's really about time. It provides time and, and sometimes resources and it's time to, uh, to write and to experiment and make mistakes and all of that. So it can be very valuable in that way. The stakes are, you know, the stakes are what they are, but they're not super high. So it allows you an opportunity to just play around, which I think is also important if you're writing, writing anything. You know, failing really hard is tremendously valuable. In a, in a contained environment. In a contained yeah. environment, yeah. <laughs> you know, we talked about a few books. Um, it, often I find, I find like when you read lists about like the best books about a single subject, right? You get the sort of same 20, right? And then when you have to teach the subject, like you're forced to rethink those lists, right? And I always read Matt's uh, the syllabus he puts out, and, and often there are news stories on there, and I'm, I'm just I'm happily surprised by the, the quality of work. And you know, and, and I just we've mentioned a few of the books that, that we love about uh, about these conflicts. Um, some of them, obviously, some of them I, I love are all sitting on this table. But there are a few other books about conflicts that I'm always trying to promote. And I'd be curious to know what what all of you think. What are the sort of like two books that you're like, man, I really wish folks had read that. Like, I think of like The Farther Shore by Matthew Eck or, you know, I, I think Virginia Woolf is like hands down one of the best World War I writers, you know, ever. So, I'd be curious to know what you think, Phil. I, I like David Jones. I mean, there's also a lot of stuff that, that you know, people don't think about, like, um, um, The Ether of Space. This is a story by Andrew Barrett about um, a physicist uh, but it's really about, you know, a father um, of somebody who died during World War One, and and how that affects his understanding of physics, uh, and it's incredible. Um, or, God, Rudyard Kipling wrote some amazing World War One stories. Mary Postgate uh, is an incredible uh, short story. Um, I, don't, I mean, there's, there's a ton of really interesting stuff out there. Um, and, and also, like, literature from, you know, people like Shusaku Endo, right? Um, you know, the Japanese perspective on World War II is somewhat different from, from uh, what, what we're used to. So it's, it's, it's always interesting to write, you know, read stuff that's outside of the, tr the sort of standard tradition. Not that Kipling is outside of the standard tradition, but I'm still thinking. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll offer, uh, in terms of poems, poetry, um, Yehuda Amakai has been really influential in my yeah. thinking over the last, I would say, two years or so. I mean, we're all probably familiar with the, the poem, The Diameter of the Bomb. But that poem, when I first read it, I mean, it really, I'll just say that it's, real, it's influenced my work. I wrote a play 
that you know, was produced earlier this year that is using his structure, that is, that is, that is using his structure, that is uh, thinking about consequences when you know, one does or does not do something. So he's been uh, very, very, very influential. Also, you know, my mentor, Yusuf Kamanyaka, just uh, his canon of work uh, has been very influential in my thinking as well. Um, recently, I've been reading Jim Borska. You know, there's uh, the way that sometimes in her work, she will remove, well, the perspective will be as though it is uh, the, the narrator is, is a god or gods looking down at, the, at humans. You get a very interesting look at human beings when you're looking at humans from the perspective of gods. So her work is uh, becoming increasingly influential. Akhmatova, her work as well. So there's, there's a lot that might not necessarily be in the, in the mainstream, right? But uh, it's out there. And if you haven't read Amakai, it's probably well worth your time. Sarah? I, I love Simborska. She's the best. Um, <laughs> well, Peter Moss's book uh, about Bosnia, I think, is really good. It's called Love Thy Neighbor. Um, and I, I, I mean, I thought a lot about Sebald when I was writing this book. Like, he, he shows up, um, Austerlitz shows up in the second half of this novel, but um, really anything by him. And I think what's valuable about his work is that the war is, is never really in the forefront. It's just kind of like has seeped into everything, like in everybody's marrow, kind of, in certain, certain ways. Um, a lot of it is like after the fact, and people ha have these traumas. And I think that's kind of an interesting um, way of dealing with it. So I already plugged Pale Horse, Pale Rider by Catherine Ann Porter, um, which is either a novella, long short story, short novel, uh, but it's worth reading, whatever, whatever its definition. Um, some other titles that were coming to mind uh, as I was stewing over your question and grace, gracefully passed. Uh, Red Cavalry by Isaac, Isaac Babel. Um, uh, Lord Jim by Conrad. I mean, not typically. It's, it's a conflict. It's a conflict book, right? Um, and and all books, whether they uh, 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 consist of well, all good books uh, consist of some some sort of conflict. Uh, I'd I'd imagine. Um, more recently, uh, uh, Girl at War by by, by Sarah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, I'm a big fan of Half of a Yellow Sun, uh, which is about uh, uh, the Nigerian Civil War uh, in, in the early '70s. I mean, it was I, read, I think I read that as when I was still in college, and and in, in true American ignorance, I didn't even know there had been a Nigerian Civil War. So it, it was one of those books that um, uh, wove a good tale around, and and was also educating me because it, you know it, it's always nice when you can finish a chapter and be like, all right, now I get to go to the internet and look all this stuff up because I don't know what it means, but I want to know what it means. Um, uh, gosh, I mean, we, we could probably go all night, but I'll, I'll stop there. So I'm going to ask one more, and then I'm going to turn it over to all of you. And um, you know, when I, I mentioned in my introductory remarks that uh, there's always been this familiarity when I read your work. You know, it, it always feels like I've read this story before, and, I, and I, that's a feeling that I, I love and I appreciate, and it's in the best of works. Um, and what's funny is that I always find myself, when I read about conflict or war in the news, I sort of, I sort of have to take a step back and, and return to fiction. For some reason, in all the work that I've ever done in national security, I, I find myself making sense of, of the chaos through literature. And I think one of the things that we have this sort of opportunity and privilege here is to talk about how this has affected us in the first world and how we are the, you know, we are the 1% as veterans, but there's, there's an opportunity, I think, that's happening in this globally, this sort of borderless world and this state of constant emergency in which we live, and that's that we have to give voice to, to those living in, in Yemen and Libya, Syria, northern Iraq. Um, and I, I wonder where where that responsibility is, and, 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 and how do we, I don't know, how do we execute on it? And I'd be curious to know what you all think. I, 
I mean, they're with us, right? Like, um, uh, it, it's funny watching the news or you read these uh, uh, screening op-eds um, and uh, not that those things are necessarily wrong, but like nobody, uh, anybody who's, who's, who's spent some time overseas, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or Croatia, uh, whether it's in the war or after, you, I, th I think it's a very um, important part of writing about um, conflict is, is seeing um, the ramifications. Like, it's, it's not just pretend, right? Um, and, uh, you know, just personally, like, not a day goes by where I don't think about my, my old interpreter or, or the, the storekeepers that, that um, uh, treated us well. You know, I mean, we were, I was an occupier for 15 months, and, and what was in these people's souls that still treated, treated me and my, my platoon uh, uh, with respect and dignity. Um, and, and, and we, we did the same. Uh, um, and now, you know, uh, the, at least the particular town I w we were on is, is right uh, on that, that, I that schism with ISIS. And, and uh, so, you know, as, as, a, as a writer, I, you know, I, you, can, you can do a lot and you can also, it's, 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 it's a lot and also nothing, right? Uh, I mean, I think that's the uh, dichotomy of just being, being an artist is, is you're writing about something so vital, but it's, it's also just happening in your head or on the paper. But, um, um, you know, treat them with the, with the dignity that you'd hope somebody who is writing about um, your life or, or, or your town um, would, would do for you and your family. Um, yeah. Well, over the years, I've been lucky enough to be able to collaborate with a uh, poet who lives in Baghdad. So what we've been able to do is... Uh, we haven't been able to bring him to the United States, unfortunately, but we've been able to bring him to Europe. So we brought him to Europe a few times. We've done uh, theatrical collabor collaborations. Every time we do that, and it was put into perspective for me last year, we did something in France. Every time we do that, every time we bring him overseas, we put his life at risk, because um, he has to go back. But what we've also been able to do is to bring his, wor bring his work. So. You know, it's not much of it, but we've been able to translate work into French and also into English. So, you know, this, it's, it's a small thing, but, you know, I feel very, uh, um, you know, honored to have been able to do that with him. But also just knowing, it was really, really, really put into perspective last year when we did our last thing and we were leaving. I was going back, to, coming back to New York. Another friend was going someplace else and he was in France, but heading back to Baghdad, and you know, the thought, my friend said to me, you know, when he goes back, they're going to kill him. I was like, what do you mean they're gonna, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> so because of the stuff he talks about, the stuff he writes about, when he goes home, they're gonna kill him. Well, that has not happened, but you know. But I, I, that's what I've been able to do over the last few years is uh, sp work specifically with folks, this person in particular, and uh, we've at least, at least been able to translate his work into English so it has a a um, limited readership, but it's still a readership. Yeah, I mean, I think translation is a really um, interesting and important tool in, in this kind of stuff. Um, and it's something that, an, you know, American audiences are becoming increasingly exposed to, but it's still pretty small, the, the amount of translated literature that Americans read. Um, so I think, you know, I don't, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> but more, more and more small presses seem to be doing, doing more to kind of promote, promote translated works, which I think is good. Um, I think it's important to record stories. And even though it feels small and it's kind of after the fact, like the ramifications are, are big. I mean, it's been 20 years since Dayton Accords in um, Yugoslavia and you know, they're still trying to count the people who are killed. So, like, if you can put something down on paper, that's not nothing. Um, yeah. It's a, I think it's an, it's an attempt to make people feel the moral stakes of what's happening and our relationship to it, right? And, you know, we're just, we're at a place right now where... <laughs> 
Every, every so often in the Northeast, I, I'm told that I'm, somebody tells me that I'm the first Iraq or Afghanistan vet that they've met, right? So, you know, there, we're a small percent of the country who serve, so you, you're not that likely to encounter the stories of somebody overseas and their relationship to the people there, and you're far, far less to hear the stories of the people there directly. Um, and so, and, and, and now the sort of increasing way that we wage wars is, is through do drones and special operations, right? Which is not just, you know, the military, which is a fraction of U.S. society, but a fraction of the military. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of things that ought to be done. But storytelling is, is one way to try and bring people in to, to, to feel the moral stakes of those things. Hi. So um, I'm just curious about when your identities as, as writers happened. You know, I kind of picture all of you, you know, uh, as soldiers with your journals, you know, um, or maybe that was, well, before that, maybe it was in middle school, or maybe it was well after that, you know, maybe it was a long time after you got back. So I'm just wondering what that, what that evolution is. Sure. Um, so I was a really socially awkward child, shockingly. <laughs> um, and I had this teacher in elementary school who was like sending home notes to my mother that were like, your daughter's really socially awkward. <laughs> um, and my mom's solution for this, which seems really counterintuitive <laughs> actually when you think about it, is um, I'm gonna make her write in a journal. Uh, so every day she would sit me at the kitchen table and I'd be like, okay, write a page about what happened today and then you're allowed to get up after that, uh, which I would do badly but it kind of became a habit and a way for me to like think about things. So writing as thinking is um, a big part of my thinking, I guess. And obviously that, that takes a different path when you're writing fiction versus just like regurgitating events. Uh, but it's, it's a muscle and it's a habit. So I think that's probably like the start for me. I, I always wrote. I mean, I, I was a big reader in, when I was a little kid. Um, and uh, I, I mean, for me, writing is like, it's, it's the best way that I know to make sense of the world, right? Because you have an idea about the world, and then you try and put it in a story, and then, and then you realize that the characters that you wrote in your story feel false. And then you try and make the characters real, and they end up just totally destroying whatever you originally thought you were writing about in the first place. Um, and you know, so that's that's just something that I really valued, right? Um, and when I came back from Iraq, there was something that was extremely important for me to figure out. It was extremely important for me to think about you know, the experience of veterans overseas and what that meant. It also was very important to, to try and think about what it meant when we came home, right? How do people interact with veterans? What is our relationship to war? What is, I mean, what is the contract that we have between the citizen and the soldier? And, um, and how does that play out? Uh, and so, I mean, that changed the way that I thought about writing. It felt more, more vital to me in a certain way. Uh, the stakes felt a lot higher, but yeah, I, I, always, I was always a writer and always a big reader. And that's, I mean, that's the other piece of it, just reading constantly. I was not a writer. Uh, when, I was, when I was young, and I still do, I'm still a reader, I read a lot. But when I was younger, you know, I, I spent my time reading uh, memoirs and you know, a lot of times about Vietnam. And also, strangely, because my father had, he had bought the encyclopedia. So I read the encyclopedia. And I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was not a writer. And not until about six years after I came back from Iraq, it was completely by random, I found this, I received an email uh, 
so the Mil Columbia Mill Vets. And at the bottom of it was this uh, ad for a writing program at NYU. And it just so happens that, happened that I had taken a year off from school because the new GI Bill was coming and I wanted to use it. So I had nothing to do on Saturday afternoons. So I ended up going down there, you know, thinking we were gonna write stories and they were teaching poetry. I met these guys there. And I think part of it was being in that community, right? It was important. But at the time, like I said, this is six years. This is six years after the war. What I realized as I started writing is I had a lot of stuff that I had not thought about, that I had not processed, that I had ignored. And when I started writing, it all started coming out. And it never stopped, you know, it just kept coming out and coming out and coming out. Uh, at that time, I was writing three, sometimes five poems a day. Because uh, I just need to, you know, get the stuff out of my head. And when I ended up back at Columbia, I switched majors. And it's, you know, I just never, I haven't looked back. You know, like a lot of writers, I, I was really bad at math. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't do a lot of things. Uh, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I think uh, a formative experience for me, uh, it was many years later that I actually self-identified as a writer, I think. But um, my, uh, my mom read A Man in Full, uh, the novel by Tom Wolfe. And uh, my mom was originally from Virginia, and she's a big Tom Wolfe fan, but she, she didn't like the way a particular, uh, a relatively uh, minor character in the novel, uh, a, a, a woman from Virginia, had been portrayed. So she wrote, you know, Random House or uh, uh, this letter, uh, 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 very politely, as a, as, as a true Virginia woman would, but uh, very forcefully, as a true Virginia woman would as well. <laughs> Uh, you know, just, and she felt better about it. Um, and then two or three months later, I mean, we, we lived in Reno, Nevada. Um, uh, uh, not necessarily a uh, literary uh, hub. Um, and uh, she got this letter back uh, from Tom Wolfe uh, 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 and, and uh, uh, admitting that perhaps he had been, he could have been a bit more fair to this minor character. Um, and I thought it was so cool that, uh, you know, this famous, the, 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 the famous man in the white suit uh, uh, had, had, had done something to both in, inspire such uh, emotion in my mom, uh, but then as a person uh, had the, the dignity uh, 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 to write back. And I thought that was so cool. Uh, and in all the wisdom of 13 or 14, uh, you know, my mom was like, well, you know, you, you enjoy writing. You're on the, uh, uh, the middle school paper. I was like, mom, writers don't come to places like Reno. She's like, you are, she sent me to my room with, uh, uh, she's like, you're an idiot, uh, which is not the first time or the last time she said that. Uh, and she sent me uh, uh, to my room with a, a book of essays from Joan Didion, who of course is from Sacramento, which is just over the hill of, of the, Sierra, the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I think that's what really kind of started. Um, uh, you know, I, I already enjoyed language. I already made sense of the world through, through the written, written word, but, but the idea of what a writer was or could be, I think, I think started there. Yeah, that's true. Hi, so uh, a couple of times we've, uh, you've um, mentioned that this is a small community that's writing about combat-related things, conflict. Um, how do you do that? So how, how do you write without or what do you do, maybe, uh, about the possibility of fetishizing like combat or fetishizing war um, or that experience? Uh, because I, I think it's a very it's, real it's, I mean, it's a, it's a real danger, and a lot of people do it, right? I mean, this is... And, and that's... I mean, that's one of the reasons that I really like Wards After War, right? Wards After War is not, a, is not exclusively a veteran thing. It's about people who are interested in this subject can come to it and talk about it, right? Like, you know, you don't have to be a veteran to be concerned with issues of war and peace. If you're an American citizen, you should be concerned with issues of war and peace because we are a country that uses military force a lot, right? And, you know, as a citizen, you have an obligation towards that. Um, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a minority to be concerned and interested in issues of, you know, racial politics in America today. 
and um, you know you don't have to be whatever you you don't have to be a woman to be concerned with you know issues of feminism like we all as a community have a relationship to everybody else in that community and we have a relationship to what we do as a community what we do as a nation it's an issue for all of us and so I think that not rarifying that experience there's a long line that you know there's a strong tradition um, in war literature of of trying to be exclusionary, actually, about it, and, and fetishizing it, right? Um, I think uh, Brian Van Reet has a great piece in the, in the New York Times on the Kill Memoir, right, which is, is a little bit about this, about sort of the, the fetish of super soldiers, which is, is one type of exclusionary thing. Um, uh, I've written a little bit about this kind of, kind of proprietary, like you wouldn't know you weren't there issue of war. If you're not a veteran, don't talk to me about war. You don't know what you're talking about, right? Um, and it's, it's certainly a danger. And, and I think, you know, one of the things to deal with it is, one, be aware of it. Be aware that it's, it's, it's easy to fetishize war, um, to be overly fascinated by it, to... Um, I mean, <laughs> there, there are a million different troublesome directions that you can go. Uh, and which, which is one of the reasons why it's important to read a lot of the great war literature because um, you learn about the, the, the assumptions that you had that you didn't even realize that you had about the subject. Drew's heard my response to this too many times, so I'll defer to Sarah Murray's. Uh, sure. Yeah, I don't know, I guess I would chime in a little bit on that too. You know, there's a, there's a scene at the end of Leslie Marmon Soko's The Ceremony, and uh, the whole book is about a veteran who's suffering severely from post-traumatic stress, and would argue probably is undiagnosed traumatic brain injury. And the book is written in both narrative and, and poetry, and um, in the tradition of the Native Americans is to sort of bring the warriors back and to rally around them and to listen to their story, and I think arguably we don't necessarily do that now, right? Like we are, we are supposed to sort of be alienated from our own culture and only, and only is socialized with one another. And like the idea of that was pretty lonely to me two years ago. Um, and I missed what it was like to be an undergraduate student, to be excited about literature. And so at the end of the, at the, end of the ceremony, the, the protagonist is telling this story that is very uniquely his own, of, all, of his journey and his struggles of coming back from war, struggling to reintegrate into his community. And one of the elders, uh, his grandmother, sort of pauses at the end and she says, she says, wait, I think I've heard this story before. So the idea that these stories are not, they're not new. Like Odysseus had, had trouble coming home from war, right? You take Odysseus and you put him in the 21st century and you give him, you give him or her a truck and, and then you, you throw him on a trail crew out west and, and, he, and he or she drives around a different job after job and then eventually makes, makes his or her way home to their hometown. Like, that's the odyssey, right? That's, that's my story, too, right? So it's not uniquely my own, and I think it's, it's dangerous to, to alienate folks. It's, it's, it's lonely, and I think it's just unnecessary. Hmm. Hello. Um, I'm not a lion, but some days I feel like Cecil, the lion that was killed. Anyway, um, and since the crux of war, the whole focus is, is really violence and men doing violence to other men. And as you mentioned, only a small percentage of people in American society, we, we are trying to sanitize it from ourselves so that when a drone is struck somewhere, next thing you know, somebody knocks down a building and I'm walking down the street and I'm innocently killed because somebody said, oh, you're American. But I didn't kill them, but I'm associated with it. The same way if I was German and there was a concentration camp a couple of feet from me and I said, oh, I'm not involved with that. But yes. I am involved with because I'm part of that country, I'm part of that nation. 
So when we give in to justifying any kind of violence, aren't we really giving in to the propaganda? Aren't we really um, giving in to the, nar the narrative? Because any, basically man's violence to man, or man is, seems to use violence as a solution for, you know, for political gains, I mean. Well, if you look at the Marshall Plan, Marshall built Europe. He did the same thing that Hitler promised the people, he, but he didn't do it through a war. It, and the same thing with, with Tojo. We, there are policies that can be done if people tr choose a peaceful path, but sometimes people right. don't choose the peaceful path, and we wind up killing millions and millions of people over... Right, though, of course, only Marshall, Marshall could have only done that after they'd won the war. The, um, I mean, I'm not... I think, I think a certain... Definitely a, a lot of skepticism um, and scrutiny should come about any time we're using military force, that's for sure. Um, and, and, you know, when you, when you use lethal force, you do not know what the second and third or, order effects are going to be. And, there's, you know, you need to be sure that you're, you have a firm rationale for doing that, right? I mean, I think... Um, you know, I'm not a pacifist. I think there are clear instances where it's, it's obvious that we should have used military force and not just, you know, in the distant past when, when, um, when ISIS was massacring Yazidi people and um, they were advancing on Mount Sinjar and there's a, just a, basically a genocide about to happen. Uh, we, you know, Obama had um, used airstrikes to try and you know, slow down the advance and allow uh, the Peshmerga to help the people leave, right? Um, unless you're a pretty hard, hardcore pacifist, that seems like a pretty clear-cut answer, right? Um, and the spectrum of, of the use of lethal th force in Iraq goes from that to a lot more dubious, shall we say, uses of military force. These are hard questions. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we are implicated in it, and they're not easy answers. And I don't think a, a kind of pure pacifism, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an easy way out, honestly. Um, but I do think that we de definitely need a lot more scrutiny in our use of military force. Yeah, I mean, God, God knows the world doesn't need more excuses to be cynical. Uh, but I think there's... Um, uh, something like 20-something years of, of recorded human history where there wasn't some sort of armed conflict occurring somewhere on the globe. Um, what does that mean f of all of us? Uh, uh, something not good, right? Like, um, uh, uh, it doesn't mean we stop aspiring uh, uh, for something better, of course, but um, it does mean that this is not a, a, a 20th century phenomenon, a 21st century phenomenon. Um, that, that said, I, th I think uh, what you said about um, you know, drone strikes happening in your name is absolutely correct. And if more American citizens had that relationship with what's going on, um, uh, the, the dialogue, the discussion, uh, not just amongst the citizenry, but, but amongst our politicians, would be vastly different, right? I mean, w it, is, it has been, uh, not to get, oh, that's how the man wants it on you, all, all hippy-dippy, but, but yeah, they... they uh, it's set up now so uh, we, can be, we can all be fat and lazy and, and not uh, Yemen is just something we hear on the news, right? Um, whether it's a, whether it's a, a, a justified drone strike uh, that, that uh, uh, hits a target that, uh, uh, of a terrorist that is, that is responsible for the deaths of, of, of 400, 400 innocent Egyptians or, or it, it's a, 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 a peaceful village. Um, that is something that every, ta you're, as a taxpayer, um, you're a part of. You know, we, we, we all uh, 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 wore the flag, um, over the American flag overseas. It wasn't just the patch of our unit, right? We're, um, uh, uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if somebody really wants to get at you, they call you a mercenary. No, sorry, I, I was wearing your flag, and you probably helped pay for it. Um, you know, you want to engage, engage about that? That I'm, I'm willing to, and, and uh, uh, that's interesting. But... Um, it's, 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 uh, it's not been, uh, despite uh, the best attempts from um, uh, both the, 
the political class as well as the economical class, uh, 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 American foreign policy has not com com completely be been out, uh, outsourced. Well, I, I just want to make sure I understand the, how the word justify is being used. So, in, is it being used in relation to literature and the literature that's being written um, in some way justifying the wars, or are we talking about the wars themselves uh, being existing and there's a justification for them and they're reflected? I'm just not, I'm just not exactly sure. Can you just clarify? Thank you for clarifying. So I think this, this goes back to our earlier conversations about, I think, intentionality. What are we actually trying to write? Uh, I, you know, I think I feel comfortable enough speaking for the people on the panel that no one up here is intending to write anything that is um, propaganda. Uh, I think, and I speak from my own writing now, what I'm trying to do uh, is for a part of it, understand Iraq, because I do write about Iraq a lot, understand my relationship to Iraq, understand as best as I can what the war looked like or looks like uh, for the people in Iraq and my relationship to them and to that. So it's not, from, you know, like, like I said, I feel comfortable with the people up here. It's not intended to be at any way um, propaganda, you know, uh, or justification for the wars. It's more, at least right now, it's, it's more of a reflection, which, trying to understand it. Now, how it's, how it's consumed, I can't control that. Um, beyond, beyond that, you know, the war, 20, year, 20, 20 years, there's only been a 20 year period. Yeah, so I think with these, the wars, I mean, it's not just Iraq, there's also Afghanistan, we don't very much talk about that. And, you know, the wars don't belong just to the soldiers, it belongs to every single one of us, every single American. And I think sometimes we don't talk about that enough. We were the ones who went overseas and fought it, but it really is our war. So yeah, when the, um, you know, the drones are being used in that way, Although I am not the drone pilot, yes, I bear some responsibility. And what I've seen specifically concerning that issue, um, I, was, I was in Maine uh, in May, and you know, people were you know, rightfully upset about that, and were, at least this is grassroots stuff, you know, we're not talking national, but they were creating um, broadsides and creating art and having discussions about about not just the war, but that specific aspect of it. So I think, you know, people, we, we're, all, we're all responsible. And if we do want to have a change, we have to be willing to have the conversations with ourselves, but also, you know, uh, more broadly. I hope that answers your question. I think we have time for one more. Um, I think it's fair to say that this country is pretty war-weary. And um, we've been through that kind of thing in previous eras. So my question really is going forward, do you, when you're writing, think about, or rather how, when you're writing, do you think about the question of whether the, the harder we try to avoid war and the more that we say it's terrible, which it is, 
how, um, does it make us more likely to get into another conflict because we're trying too hard to avoid what we shouldn't? And I, I, I was listening to your answer about you know, the Yazidis and I really, that resonated with me. Thank you. Sarah, I mean, the Balkans happened uh, in the 90s, so I feel like you could probably speak to the, what war wariness looks like in that region. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's really interesting to see what's happening now. I mean, I think last week was the anniversary of the genocide in Srebrenica, which was like a, an entire town kind of taken out, um, 8,200 8, people approximately. And um, the Serbian prime minister went there. Well, first, the Russian, uh, Russians vetoed a commemoration of that massacre at the UN. And then the Serbian prime minister went uh, to this ceremony. And they just you know, threw a bunch of shit at him because they were mad. So it's, it's like, it's really, um, it's, it's frustrating to see the ramifications of things like the Dayton Accords, which were set up to create peace and did create peace, but then also stagnated things in a lot of ways. The ways that the government functions uh, also prevents progress. And that was, you know, sh sure, it did stop the war because we kind of split power evenly between ethnic groups, but now, like, you can't do anything because we split power evenly between ethnic groups. Um, You can't have a country with three presidents that like functions efficiently, you know. Uh, and the way that we, we write about it is, is just as important, like the way that we take down the names of people who are missing, who are killed, the way that we write about this conflict in the history books is something that people are arguing about a lot now. Um, you know, how, how will kids who, you know, these, these first, there's been kids for about 10 years now 15 that have been born outside of the conflict and um, you know they're going to read about it in school so what should it say and this is like something I'm sure uh, we'll be dealing with in America too the way that we write, write stuff down and then understand it and then do more stuff you know I don't know if we're war weary I mean we're certainly weary of putting you know boots on the ground right I mean, we have Although a, we have 60% of Americans supported a year ago uh, uh, ground intervention in Syria. Right. So, well, I, I, wonder, I wonder what those numbers would look like if it got close to a, like a, uh, like looking like we were actually going to do it. But, um, but we're very comfortable with continuing, you know, like, I mean, technically the wars are over, right? But we're still killing people in a lot of different countries, which sounds like war it's just it's just you know sort of you know drones airstrikes special operations advisors it's it's a it's a lighter footprint um you know i i, I don't think we're war weary we just we just don't want really expensive wars right and you know the <laughs> or wars that we feel like we have to pay that much of attention to and i think you know all right What do we do about ISIS? You know, you mentioned the Marshall Plan earlier in Europe. We certainly don't want to do anything that expensive, but we're very happy to do a few airstrikes and, and act like we're solving the problem. And, um, you know, those are, very, those are two very different types of intervention. And, and uh, I think that, that we're, we're, we're quite comf comfortable with continuing the use of, of lethal force as long as it doesn't cost too much, and as long as we don't have to feel like we're, we're putting too much at stake, and I think that's a problem. I, I believe Americans are sick of hearing about war. Um, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the same thing as wariness. I, I, know, I, I know war wariness when I talk to one of my former sergeants who's, been, who's spent the, the better part of his 20s, his youth, uh, uh, deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, five or six tours, a uh, year, year, year at a time. I believe uh, the Iraqi people are certainly, certainly war wary at this point. Um, just because we left in 2011, um, it's clear that uh, uh, the war has not ended for them. Afghanistan, you know, whatever you want to call it now, it's still a war. I mean, bombs are, bombs are being dropped, people are being killed. Um, 
you know, I, 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 I'm just, I'm very concerned about um, as a citizen now, because um, uh, I've, I've been out longer than I was in, just as a citizen in terms of, of, of the way we uh, think, of, think of this, right? Um, it, it is so, uh, how anybody, uh, how any thinking person in my mind um, could have uh, uh, witnessed and, and, and thought about the last 14 years, uh, particularly with what happened in Iraq, and, 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 and still say, uh, well, clearly boots on the ground in Syria is the solution, is beyond me. I mean, if, if, you, if the American public determines that direct intervention uh, and uh, boots on the ground is what's needed, that's going to require trillions and trillions of dollars. That's going to require young men and women from, from all over this country being, being killed. Uh, 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 there, there's no wishy-washiness now. I mean, uh, I, I believe Marshall, speaking of Marshall, maybe it was another famous World War II uh, uh, general, but s said no democracy can handle a war past five years. Um, and I think that's very relevant, e even, even with an all-volunteer force today, because we, it's just not ingrained. We, we, uh, we were founded as a revolution, right? Like, we, we, we were reflexive. We, we, we are not comfortable viewing ourselves as an empire, even though that's how we carry ourselves or we conduct ourselves overseas. Um, no, if, 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 we get, if we want to intervene, let them intervene and let them do it, do it the right way. But just know, it, just know your grandchildren might be over there finishing the job. The more we try to avoid war, which we're doing, you know, that's what everyone wants to forget. Like, let's not do this anymore. Do, does it make us more likely to be in another war? Does it make it more inevitable? Do you think about that? that? That's the other question. Do you think about that when you're writing? Do you think about that question? I mean, I know I do. I mean, Matt and I have talked about this before, even in a classroom. And, and I think the idea that, that we've only been at war since 9-11 is, is, is a, it's fictional. I mean, Grenada, Panama, Cold War, Army of the Mujahideen, the, the anti-communist activities down in South America, the School of the Americas. I mean, the idea that this is a new phenomenon, these small wars. I mean, we didn't just dream up the counterinsurgency manual, right? We had a lot of practice, you know, in South America and in Southeast Asia. There are places we haven't even mentioned that I served. You know, the Philippines, the Abu Sayyaf group, the Militant Islamic Liberation Front, you know, the second largest Muslim population in Southeast Asia. I mean, these are, these are battlefields um, that Americans and, 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 and many, many others have died upon. And I think the idea that it only happened in Iraq and Afghanistan um, is something that we really need to consider about when we say war weariness is that I feel like we've been at war. I don't know, my grandfather went to Korea, late 50s, went to Vietnam in the early 60s. My dad joined in the set in the late 70s. My family's been at war for the last 50 years. I think, I think some of us are just waking up to that fact. So. Yeah, and I would, I would say, I don't think we're necessarily avoiding it. I think right now, especially in the Middle East, I think we're just being very careful because we don't necessarily have a strategy that we can implement without committing 500,000 troops and spending seven years and having 100,000 dead. We just don't know how to do that yet. Once we can figure that out, we'll do it. So I don't know if we are, you know, war wary in the sense that I think certain parts of the American populace might be war wary. I don't think I'm, well, the individual soldiers and Marines, sure, are certainly war wary. I don't think we're war wary. I think we're just being very careful at this moment. I, I, for some reason, I think, I think this, uh, question or the discussion uh, brought to mind uh, David Foster Wallace's brilliant essay, Just Asking, which it's very short, it's worth reading if you haven't. Um, it's maybe a thousand words, it ran in the Atlantic. Um, but it, it poses the question that if we are a representative democracy, or if we're aspiring to be uh, the America, the idea that we, we hear about, is, 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 is being vulnerable part of that, right? Uh, because the idea of preemptive war um, uh, does run contrary to a lot of the ideals that we profess. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, a ser it's an essay posed in a series of questions. Um, so you might not get any answers in it, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely worth, worth thinking over and, and potentially brooding over. 
That's the teacher in you, posing that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to Brooklyn Historical Society. Thank you, Thank you to all of you. Appreciate it.